Hey everybody, it's Mark Schultz here and we are live for another edition of Recovery in Aviation. Today we're going to be talking about the challenge of line maintenance in the industry. We're going to be talking about engineering support and parts and materials. And I have a guest speaker with us today, Randy Steenholt from the STS Aviation Group. You are not going to want to miss this. This is real-time information that's going to help you to be successful. Stay Hey, welcome everybody to join our program today. I want to introduce uh, Randy Steenholt. Randy, how are you today? Wonderful. Good afternoon, Mark. My name is Randy Steenholt. I'm the Senior Vice President for STS Engineering Solutions. And the bigger company is the STS Aviation Group. In one overall summary, we are global. and We provide aviation services throughout the industry. Fantastic. Randy, we're going to dig into that um, in just a few minutes. I wanted to ask you quickly before we get going, uh, where, where, are you, where are you coming from today in your broadcast? You're, you're in the state of Minnesota, right? I am. Six good months in the northern part of Minnesota by their 10,000 lakes. So I've got uh, a great background for that. And when that snow starts coming, we head on down to Florida. Great. Awesome. Hey, just for you guys watching today, um, just want to tell you, Randy and I, um, we maybe have disconnected a few times over the years, but we uh, we met originally back when we both worked at Northwest Airlines. Um, I think it was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And that really dates us, Randy. I'm sorry to do that, you know, to date us like that. But <laughs> yeah, great, great memories. That was a great company to work for. It really was. Um, I was managing tech pubs and part of engineering and some different things. I think maintenance training and different things like that. What were you doing at that time, Randy? After my stint with Boeing in Wichita, Kansas, I was given the opportunity to build up a credible engineering organization with 24-7 leads on engineering support, supporting the back shops, and supporting our complete Northwest operation. So what an exciting time in the industry. Yeah, great. So you had some good operational hands-on experience during that time. That's great. Absolutely. Fantastic. Very good. Hey, listen, everybody watching out there today, we're having a discussion today about um, recovery in aviation, and it's really been my passion and focus, and that's why I try to bring, bring interesting guests on the program like Randy. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, about STS and, and some of the challenges that we have in the industry, but I would really appreciate it if you would share this live stream out for us, because when you do that, it really helps us to get traction out there. And so if you look at your screen down in the bottom right-hand corner down there, there's a little arrow or right arrow that says share. And if you share this out, a lot of other people that want to hear this information will also be able to join in with us and learn. And then the second thing is, is that we want your comments. We want to, we want your comments and we're actually here live um, to answer your questions live um, in the program. And so the first thing I like to ask people to do is just tell us where you're watching from. And uh, I really appreciate knowing who you are and, and where you're coming in from. And we'll throw your name up on the screen and give you a little bit of recognition. We actually have our first taker to my offer here. And it looks like we have Brian Shaw, who's uh, joined us. Hey, uh, Randy, I think you know Brian Shaw, don't you? <laughs> I do. He, he does a very good job for us at STS. They work together at STS. Brian, thanks for joining us. And uh, if there's others of you out there, which we know there are, um, we usually have people all around the world that are watching. I would appreciate it if you would comment in the box and uh, just let us know where you're watching from and we'll take your questions live. Randy, let's dive right in. People wanna hear um, about STS. Um, I know that STS is uh, one of the largest maintenance providers, um, You know, probably the largest maintenance provider in North America, line maintenance provider, and you have other lines of business. Would you help us out by understanding a little bit about what STS does? Sure. Due to some very strong leadership and entrepreneurs 16 years ago, STS was strictly a contract placement company. But at that point, they decided to branch out. They hired me to head up the engineering, maintenance programs, and reliability. We started our first line maintenance company with one line station. And throughout the years, through acquisition, through, through growth, fast forward 16 years, we are now three major divisions within STS. One of the largest ones would be the aviation services, which engineering, maintenance programs, and reliability, reliability falls into along with line maintenance and our hangar operations domestically and abroad, along with our, our maintenance and modification facilities as well. Our second division would be our parts and components, which is also global, very strong out there. And then thirdly, it's, it's our original portion of STS, which is our, our placement industry in which we offer contract placement, permanent placement, or contract to permanent placement. So between all three, 
It was a result of listening to our customers, building what they asked us to do and delivering. I think a lot of people just don't realize how much STS has grown over the last, you know, maybe 10, 15 years, like what you said. I don't think I knew that STS was the largest line maintenance provider in North America. That's, um, you know, it's really amazing. I think sometimes we just think things are a little bit static out there in the industry, but, you know, the company's really been growing. Congratulations to you guys. Thank you. Uh, certainly, we've had to downsize a little bit with COVID. It's changed yeah. everybody's business plans. But currently, I believe we're at 29 active line stations in the United States, seven in Europe. At our peak, we were, we were at 37, I believe. So we should be back to that shortly and going north of there shortly. That's great. Congratulations. Hey, Randy, one of the things I like to do to get traction as we do these live broadcasts is we like to continue to recognize when people are joining the broadcast and saying things. And so we throw you know their names and things up on the screen. So let's recognize a few more people as we move forward. Um, we have Charles Barnes. Uh, he watches on it with great frequency. He's down in St. Louis. Charles, thanks for joining us. I, I appreciate you being here today. And uh, it's always exciting. I spent a lot of time in the UAE and um, uh, in the Middle East and those different areas. And here we have Zafar. Um, he's joining us uh, from uh, Air Arabia. Zafar, um, or I'm sorry, uh, it's, I guess that he it was abbreviated his last name. I'm a little difficult on the first name there, but thanks for joining us. And then we have Matt Churches. He's uh, He's in the UK. He, he does a, a great job of joining us on a regular basis. Matt, I guess you're saying the MRO is picking up faster than expected in the UK. Randy, that's good news, isn't it? You know that we're seeing absolutely, that. absolutely, absolutely. And then we have us. Then we have Solomon, um, who's joining us from uh, Ethiopian Airlines. We've had some great conversations in the past from Ethiopia. Thanks, Randy. Look at what I'm telling you. Is that we we always have people join from all around the world. It's actually absolutely incredible. Um, and then uh, my good friends in Saudi Arabia. I spent five years going back and forth to Jeddah and and doing some really interesting work there for uh, Saudi. Basam, thanks for joining us. Um, I really appreciate that. Let's see, who else do we have? Shauna from Austin, Texas, right here around the corner, uh, manager of uh, sales manager for Epic Fuels. Hey, um, Shauna, you're going to have to reach out to me. I'd like to know who Epic Fuels is. We'll have to have a conversation about that. You'll have to send me a message. Let's see. Then we have uh, SAEI. Um, Randy, are you familiar with SEI, Saudi Arabian um, uh, Engineering uh, Industries? Limited. Limited. A little bit. Well, they're an MRO there. That's Basam again. But uh, SAEI, I did a lot of work with them. They're a really big MRO um, in Jeddah and uh, got a lot of work going on, not just for um, for uh, Saudi, but for other uh, aircraft in the region, other operators in the region. And uh, let's see. Then we have Simon Barker. Hey, Simon. I'm glad to have you here. They have a, a conference coming up soon with Aerospace Tech Review. You guys should check that out. And just one last person before we move on here. Uh, Nitin from Mumbai. Look at that, Randy. We think we got a compliment of most of the continents, just except for Asia right now, I guess. So, well, it always goes back to that statement: it's a it's a small family globally. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Hey, listen, um, you know, guys, thanks, and and for all you watching here today, thanks for putting your names in. Keep doing that. I appreciate it. If you have some questions as we're going on here now today, um, give us a shout out. Give us your questions. But I want to dig into the the meat of um of talking about STS a little bit. Um, now, Randy, you talked a little bit about the business grew because you were meeting the challenges and demands, you know, of the different businesses or the, the needs of operations out there. One of the first things that we talked about so far is line maintenance. What's really happening, you know, out there right now with respect to line maintenance? Is it growing? Is it declining? Is there a need for services? You know, there's a lot of activity that's that's ramping up right now. Oh, ramping up. That That wasn't even a joke, but it worked. So there, there's a lot of activity happening right now out there. Randy, what's what's going on in the area of line maintenance today? Always a strong need and in today's environment, even stronger with, with most operators coming back after a difficult time with COVID and trying to find the competent mechanics out there. It's certainly a very difficult arena now to, to get those mechanics back in. Some have left the industry on there. We've been very pleased in that with with our intrinsic growth for line maintenance, that we realized we couldn't really compete with these mom and pop onesies, twosies type ones. We went through some acquisitions and approximately five years ago, we became the largest line maintenance station. And what it really boils down to is we truly provide a cost-effective means for supporting the legacy oper operators along with, the, along with the regionals. In that case in point, my second home is is Fort Myers, RSW is, is the area, in which 
There's several operators there doing maybe three flights a day. To do so, to have seven day operation, three shifts, you may expend 15 to 18 heads to do so, and you just can't, you just can't get that payback. For STS to step in, we can support the majority of those operators with a more robust head count, and we can do it so everyone makes money at the business on there. So that's that's been our business model. We we've got an old saying. One of our one of our owners is a baseball player. We're not out there to hit home runs. We hit singles and doubles. We wanna we wanna make a little bit of money at the end of the day, but we wanna make it fair and expand very nicely. Randy, what are the what are the kind of services that you see people looking for and asking for? You know, in line maintenance. What are the demands? What I'm trying to get at is, a, what are the problems that people have and and what are they looking for, you know, today? Our typical is the meet and greets, which happen every time it comes in. Overnight, we'll be looking at log pages, addressing those. But again, STS is quite aggressive. We, we listen to our customer base. And we know that with overnights, you're going to find some, some damage, perhaps some dents that exceed SRM limits, whatever it may be. And often it's difficult to get a hold of other organizations' infrastructure. That's why with the STS family, that truly synergy is, is what, we, what we do in that our line maintenance, once they find those, those damages, can contact our 24-7 engineering and we can give the customer prompt cost-effective support right there. Where initially they didn't realize we had those offerings, we, we can show them that we can get their airplane up and flying and make money. Now, Randy, I know your background, you know, comes from engineering and you did those things when you were in operations and when you were at Boeing in different places. So tell me, for example, is what kind of service, what kind of engineering services are needed by people out there today? You said like if an aircraft pulled up and it had damage or something, just explain to the viewers out there the kind of things that STS does in supporting that kind of a situation. That's a great question because it really starts with an operator's procedures and their typically approved by their PMI, therefore FAA approved, in which I've worked with so many operators out there because at Northwest Airlines, I was involved to rewrite the major minor logic chart. And that's really the backbone of engineering in which from there, we were very creative. It became a new industry standard. And so I worked with operators to first change over their general maintenance procedures, incorporate a more robust major minor logic chart which means that we can go in and minimize what in the past was considered major repairs, which requires DER or OEM support. And we can more so utilize acceptable data for minor repairs. I'm getting in kind of deep, but that allows the flexibility and the creativity to get their airplanes flying faster. So I've got a team of engineers scattered throughout the US, Europe and abroad that is very, very highly trained in liaison engineering 24 seven and have a passion like me, which was instilled in me, as you well know, at Northwest Airlines, every minute that airplane is out of service, that that's, that's money out of the till. Yeah. Now I know people would have options of the way they can approach this thing. And, uh, you know, people could hire their own engineers to be, you know, on staff and provide that kind of service and capability, or they could go back to the OEM and provide that service and kind of capability. Why would somebody find themselves using the services of a third party company, you know, like STS, for example, to provide engineering services? What's the difference? You're right. Those are the two legitimate means for them to hire up an expensive engineering organization, not only for the engineers, but someone that's got credibility, industry experience is going to be very expensive. And then to man a, a 24 7, seven day a week for overlap and all that gets to be exceedingly expensive and then add on to that any sort of der structures electroavionics systems power plant composites uh, very expensive so that overhead is phenomenal now if you compare it with the oems and i work for for boeing great company it's a large large ship and it takes a long time for that ship to turn so you don't get that prompt support and because of the internal bureaucracy the cost to run a company like that you have high cost going to the OEM compared to a company such as STS, which which we can turn on a dime, provide that prompt response for a fraction of the cost. So I, I hear what you're saying is that to hire a staff internally, you know, would require you to, you know, be able to staff a, a larger, probably a larger range 
of uh, time frames and, and support than maybe what people initially would want to. So that, that sounds interesting. And then I know myself, I also worked for McDonnell Douglas and Boeing myself. And I know that uh, the cost of getting the manufacturer to do it in the turnaround time doesn't always necessarily meet the operations. You know, yeah, exactly. Hey, um, Randy, uh, I, I like to allow questions to be asked as we go so people don't wait till the end because maybe sometimes they don't even stay till the end. But I wanted to recognize a couple of people that have joined here as well. Um, we have uh, we have George uh, uh, Pachikov who joined us um, as well. George, thanks for joining us with Katona or Cartona 3D. I appreciate that. Uh, we have Ahmedi, who's uh, I know he's in uh, Ahmed um, El Shady, who's in uh, Egypt, and um, I appreciate you always joining. You know from Egypt. Um, the next one is the question that I wanted to throw up here. We have a quest a question from. Uh, 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 Zafar is how he used his reference in the past. But Randy, maybe you could look at this. It says, how do you predict post-pandemic MRO business? What are the requirements of the MRO enterprises, you know, to survive in the future? What do you think is different before the pandemic and now after the pandemic for an MRO to survive? Our biggest obstacle, not just STS, but I said, say the industry is getting qualified technicians. We're fortunate in that we've got strong relationships with, with uh, institutions that are training these, these young individuals coming out. Also, we've got very tenured contract personnel that we've used in the past. We offer in, enticing salaries, uh, offer benefits with it. it. It's very difficult to, to get the individuals there. So we've got to become very creative to get those qualified people there as well. So that's probably the, the biggest difficulty. That and then being, being flexible with the operators in, in that the demand is always high, but, but can we switch airplanes around? Are there various ways that we can utilize non a and type, type mechanics, keep the cost down and, and get more people on the airplane? So again, we're always scratching our heads, work with our customer, of course, very closely and and looking at what other operators are doing and, and looking in to see what makes sense. Yeah, Randy, in my discussions with a lot of different people in the industry over the last maybe six months, you know, we all know that there was a shrinking back that occurred in a lot of areas, of course. And, um, you know, some people were laid off. Uh, you know, some people went and went to different industries. And then now that we've seen a resurgence of activity in the U.S., um, last week I looked at the TSA uh, you know, passenger travel statistics, and they're right about equal to what they were before the pandemic, about 2 million people a day, I think is what it was. And, um, and so we know that things are growing. And the end result is, is that um, we've not been able to hire people and to bring them back in as quickly as what maybe we had to let them go or people went into other areas. And so I think that it's very creative that you provide staffing sources or alternatives to people that maybe have spike demands in their needs that you can provide line maintenance and you can provide engineering and other contract labor sources. I think that really sounds like an interesting approach to solving this, you know, post pandemic, you know, MRO problem that people have. Definitely we have labor shortages right now. So I, it sounds like you guys are stepping up to that demand right now, right? Yes. And it really comes down to the old adage of supply and demand right now, a, a, a mechanic technician can garner a higher wage good for them. And, and so we just need to look at that. We need to be competitive again, not only with our salaries, but also with our, with our benefits. And that's where I think we stand heads above our, our competition, be able to entice the well-qualified individuals. Yeah. MROs and, and line stations and airlines all over the world, you know, employ contract people all the time, you know, either to be able to open new stations rapidly or to be able to meet, you know, temporary demands or even on a longer term kind of a basis. And uh, I, I just think that's a great business model that you guys have. So I, I, I like that. And I think that really helps us to recover as we're going forward. If you had to put some quick numbers to it, anywhere from an 80-20 split to a 70-30 split because of the cyclic nature of, of aircraft maintenance on there, you've got your peak times and you get your slow times. And so that's, that's the beauty of, of utilizing contract support. So it's been a, a staple for STS, always has been and always will be going forward. Great. Good. That's a good strategy. I think that people should look at um, in trying to survive. So thanks for asking that question so far. So Randy, so far we've talked about, you know, line maintenance and some of the demands and meeting line maintenance needs in the industry. And we talked a little bit about some of the engineering services that people need and, uh, and how you're providing contract labor um, as well out there in the industry. 
Now, you also mentioned at the top of the hour when we when we were live that the STS is also involved in parts and materials. What what is what does STS do in the area of parts and materials today? Really, two distinct areas. One is OEM distributorship, and the other one is just more of your parts, components, materials, kitting, that aspect of it. So going back to the OEM distributorship, such companies as Safran, as Curtis Wright, as Marathon Norco, what, what we do, and we've got some very talented individuals in that, in that division, is that we will buy bulk from the OEMs and get a much better price. And it's looking at the industry usage rate and location, which is equally as important. So we will buy up bulk. We will, we will set them in, in very set areas around the world where the usage is at. And we're able to, again, better support the customer base out there just by simply listening to them and their demands. So that's helped out very well for us. So pricing, definitely. That sounds like an advantage when you can buy, you know, from multiple operators or multiple MROs. That's good. Um, you know, I've um, I've had a lot of people mentioning to me that, you know, that there's a lot of supply and demand um, uh, supply chain uh, constraints or issues out there right now. How does using somebody like STS help address the challenge that people have right now with some of the supply chain problems and actually getting parts? And you're right. Next to headcount, I'd say that's probably our biggest challenge out there. And, and we see the industry getting better on there. But again, it goes back to our internal synergies, such as there may be alternative parts or components that may be available. And we know that by my engineering department working closely with the parts and components division in that can we take a similar part and do comparative analysis to see if that's going to be acceptable or does it take some slight modification so again by just being creative and putting some some heads together we've been quite successful in in addressing those shortages by by being creative and using alternate parts you know, Randy, I really like that because um, most of the people that I've talked to have kind of focused on we need to optimize the supply chain, which, by the way, is a really important part. And and with respect to digital and digital transformation, um, I find that the technology we have today and the analytics that we have today, you know, we can make some pretty significant impacts on optimization of the supply chain, having the right information and knowing about, you know, our parts utilizations and some analytics can make a really big difference. So I'm a big promoter of that. But but what you've just described is a whole nother aspect of it, which you're saying we, we're recognizing there's a shortage and we're trying to help with solutions like looking for alternatives, you know, for looking for alternative parts or, um, uh, you know, different ways that we can solve the problem. Nobody's mentioned that to me before. That's uh, that's really interesting. It's a whole nother angle on that right now. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, do you also supply, you said you support uh, OEMs and uh and are you providing uh, warehousing and pooling of their parts, or what? How are you? How are you working with OEMs to supply um, uh, their parts into the industry? That's exactly the case. Most often, if you require a part component, if you call the OEM because they just don't drop everything to make that part, they'll typically give you lead time. Lead time can be six months, it can be nine months, it can be a year. Your airplane needs the part now to make some money. And we understand that very clearly. So again, through through our purchase acquisitions of many parts, again, we're, we're given a discount from the OEM. It, it's got to be a business model. We've got to look at our at our payback on that. But say we buy up 100 components and we place them in eight known entities throughout the United States and or abroad, that we can charge, in essence, about the same price as the OEM, but provide our customers that prompt support that they need. So it's truly a win-win. So it's listening to our customers again, looking through their usage rates and not only going to one company that may fly predominantly the, the Boeing 737s, we can now go to another company and utilize what, what we've garnered for information for industry knowledge and go to them with, with, some, with some approaches to solve their problems. Great, great approach to, uh, you know, maximizing the availability of parts and pools and sharing them. That's a great approach. I like that. Um, I know that's been really popular for a lot of operators in a lot of regions. So it's good to see you guys leveraging that. 
Hey, um, I see we have another question I'd like to take down there. Um, and uh, a, just a quick statement and then a question. It says, um, one of the strategies adopted by many companies is trying to prevent uh, cash burn down. Um, how do you put this into effect? Uh, uh, thankful you have some experience. So let's see, let's interpret what that means. Um, trying to prevent cash burn down. So how do we how do we keep ourselves in a more positive cash position by using STS services, Randy, if I could try to summarize that. Well, I can selfishly start out with engineering. That's that's my bailiwick. Okay, way. that's uh, your expertise. Do it. Again, with we know that most, if not all, the industry downsized. And now during these good times, they will slowly start building up on there. But for these larger companies to hire back engineers, first you need to see if those engineers are available to get them back into the company trained and everything that takes with it could be months worth there. Whereas if these companies contact STS, we can do it overnight. We've got the procedure set up again with our infrastructure of 24 seven globally. And any time of the day, you will get a warm voice on the phone that we can do that initially while, while the company is still sourcing their, their permanent headcount. But often, once we get involved and they realize the service that we provide, not only the prompt cost effective service, but but the creativity that, that we utilize as well, for them it becomes an internal business model to say, maybe we don't need our own staff. Maybe an STS will, will suffice for, for this. So uh, it, it gives, again, the operator, our customer, the choice. You know, one of the things I've found over the years is that, uh, you know, we, we get into a method of operating and we think that it's working and it's the cheapest or most effective way that we can do it. And it's just easier sometimes not to change the direction of the ship, just to keep things going in one direction. But, you know, many times if we'll reevaluate what we're doing and look at creative alternatives, we can make a pretty significant impact in cost, reduced cost, um, you know, improve turnaround times you know, optimize our operation in a lot of different ways. And sometimes it just takes stepping out of our comfort zone and where we currently are and how things are stable and looking at for other alternatives, because who knows? I mean, you could be sailing right to the edge of, you know, a waterfall at that point in time. Okay. You know, and, and, and if you're headed toward a bad situation, you know, let's turn, let's go in a different direction. Okay. And you may not even know it. And so I really, I would really like to challenge people out there is the question really was, is that how do we optimize operations? How do we improve our cash position? What do we do, you know, post pandemic? Randy, I say, look at alternatives, you know, look at different ways of doing things than what you did before, because if you stay static, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You better look for uh, alternatives that will adapt to what's happening around you. Mark, that's great insight. And I say it often within my organization for engineering, we, we hire younger engineers right out of school. It's great, their enthusiasm, their knowledge, but yet we train them about the airplane and substantiation analysis. And they're asked us questions as they should throughout the process. And most questions we've already got the answer for. We've all been in the industry a long time, but every now and then you get that question, which, which you say, Eureka, what, what, a great, what a great question. We never thought of it that way. And, and now with, with post-COVID, if we can say post-COVID, that I think most operators are at that juncture of the business say, Let, let's stop, let's see what the future is going to look like. What makes sense cost-effective-wise cost on there? So I think you're spot on with your analysis. You know, you know, when we get old, we think things are impossible. But the, the good news is that young people, they don't know that something isn't impossible. OK, and, and they and they try new things and they try new ideas and they go do things, you know, like somebody says, I'm going to send a rocket to Mars. And and people say, well, that's impossible. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, we just need to take new ideas. We need to grab hold of them. We need to, you know, not be afraid of it. And there are some good products and services out there that if we latch on to can really help us to be successful in this industry. There's no question and, and about Mark, it. As a leader at STS, certainly I've got to make sure I don't become an impedance, a stagnant, stagnant person in, in regard to going forward on there. So you're absolutely right. We need to we need to look at all ideas that are coming forward and see what makes sense. Yeah. Randy, let me ask you sort of a personal question. I just want to ask you this is that what are you most excited about in the aviation industry at this point in time? We are all going through a massive rebuild 
And, and that, that is so exciting. And just what we just got done talking about is to stop, identify your current processes and see what makes sense, what can be improved upon. And so for me, that's going to propel everybody up to a whole new level again, not only in, in the processes, but, it, but again, financially, we are all getting more and more astute to looking at these operations financially as well. That's why we're, we're in business. So again, each, I, I'm the eternal optimist. The, each time the industry goes through difficulties, that that's now a new opportunity to excel out there. So for me, it's, it's, uh, I enjoy learning. So it's, a, it's another opportunity to do so. That's a great way to look at it. It's not, uh, it's not a problem that we had in the industry, but it's an opportunity you know, to optimize or to make things better or to redesign what we're doing today. That's, that's a great perspective. Thank you. Hey, listen, um, we've talked a lot about a lot of really good things today. And uh, I know that people might want to reach out to you and continue a conversation with you. Um, we have a couple of ways which people can reach out to you. Uh, here is the slide again, and uh, Randy's name is Randy Steenholt. Reach out to Randy if you'd like. Um, his email address is at the bottom there. I think we have a banner we can throw up there as well to give your email address. And uh, Randy, is this a good email address for people to reach you at? That is. Good, good. And uh, if they want to learn more about STS as a group as a whole, here's the website for STS. Reach out and uh, take a look at that. So um, is your email the best way for people to get in touch with you? It is. And I can also forward that to the appropriate person or organization if they have other STS questions. Be more than happy to do so. Good. Fantastic. Randy, I really appreciate you taking time to have this conversation with us today. Um, I am absolutely passionate about aviation and about the aviation industry. Um, I was 13 years old and my dad put me in the right seat of a Ford Trimotor. And ever since then, I was absolutely hooked, okay? And um, I got my A&P license. I got my commercial instrument multi-engine pilot license, my engineering degree, business degree. And I've been in aviation for, you know, almost 40 years now at this point in time. And uh, I'm absolutely passionate about it. And I love engaging with people like yourself who have been in the industry for a long time and are passionate about it as well and passionate about helping other people. And I wanted to congratulate you personally and STS for all you're doing in the industry to help the success of this industry, especially during a difficult time when we're trying to create recovery. So, Randy, thank you so much for all you're doing within the industry. Mark, I appreciate the opportunity this morning. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Great. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, we are here weekly on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. And so be sure to join us going forward. Fair winds and following seas to you all. Have a great day.